This video is all about conversations and how to resolve them in your Dungeons & Dragons game. When are you supposed to roll the dice? And when are you meant to just go with the flow? Today we're talking about D&D social interactions in three areas. The meta, which is the out of game bits, we're talking about the mechanics, which is the rules and the dice rolling, and the miscellaneous, which is all the stuff in between. This video is made possible by all the lovely people over at Patreon, who voted on this topic to be made into a full-blown video. This topic was suggested by either Andy King or Son of Sofman. I can't remember. I'm so sorry. I'm a bad friend. But if you want to support the channel, please subscribe, leave a comment, and check out the Patreon up here. You know, find my custom rules for social interactions in combat. Your support helps keep the lights on. First off, let's talk about the meta. As players in Dungeon Masters, what's the purpose of social interactions? I do sound like a terminal introvert here. What, why do we need to socialize anyway? But in D&D, social interactions with NPCs are either about characters trying to either get information, which is tell us about your missing family, or they're trying to get the character to take some kind of course of action, like put down your weapon or else. Now, these social interactions in D&D, they're different than real life conversations. Because in real life, conversation is surrounded by niceties and learning people's names and saying hello and goodbye and discussing the weather. But conversations in D&D, they're more like dialogue in literature and media, lean and purposeful. In books and television, conversations are about learning information, about the setting, the tone, the themes, things that enrich the story or cover some kind of important information needed to get from one scene to the next. One-to-one -one realism sometimes takes a back seat to functionality in this case. I reckon you should aim for your social interactions rather than being realistic like real life. I think they should be more like a scene in a movie and your players are gonna pick up on this and you'll get more out of your social interactions. So here are some quick tips on how to achieve this. Number one is to get to the point. Have the NPCs state their goals upfront and clearly. The farmer will tell you everything they know about their missing family without hesitation and they ask you to help. The toll bandits, they want money and they will stick you with the pointy things if you refuse. Side note, this means that when you are roleplaying an NPC, you should know what the point of that NPC is and what their goal is. Stay on topic is number two. If discussion becomes off topic or deviate from the NPC's goals or the goals of the actual scene, then escalate the situation. Maybe the farmer becomes more upset when the party asks irrelevant questions or make in-jokes and the bandits become nervous at the party stalling. Number three is to create an out. Have a way for your NPC to communicate that they are definitely finished talking with the party and spur them on to the next scene. Maybe the farmer becomes inconsolable about his missing family and implores the party to head off before it's too late. Or the tall bandits, they grow impatient. The tall bandits or the tall bandits grow impatient and fire their crossbows. Alternatively, you could just say directly to the players as a dungeon master, hey guys, I think you've gotten everything useful out of this guy. What do you, what do you want to do next? And just move them on like that. Number four is to skip the boring parts. Not every social interaction has to be a fully fleshed out NPC with an accent and a backstory. I mean, if the information is generally and easily accessible, you can paraphrase it. Like you ask around town for directions about the local blacksmith and eventually you lead to a friendly old lady who takes you to her son's workshop and leaves you with a bag of sweets before departing. Oh, I love this lady. Though, of course, this doesn't apply to every social interaction. If the social interaction is an NPC that's key to your campaign or a recurring character, or just somebody the party likes, you know? Maybe they've taken a shine to this character. Hey, feel free to take your time with it, have some fun. Next, let's move on to the mechanics. This is the part where social interaction comes into contact with the rules. And when I say rules, it's, it's still kind of loose. This isn't conversation combat with a hard and rigid system. So it's important to keep a little bit of flexibility when it comes to your social interactions. Mechanically, the tools given to the players for their social interactions are persuasion, deception, uh, insight. Oh, what's the other one? What's the other one? Deception? No. Intimidation. <laughs> An intimidation. So let's look at how to use these tools as a player and how to exploit them as a dungeon master to get more out of your social interactions mechanically. Number one is to use dice sparingly. The more dice rolls you put into the social interaction, the more likely the party are going to fail a roll and end up with an unsatisfactory uh, social interaction. Only use the dice at friction points in the conversation where things could take a meaningful turn or an NPC needs to be you know, convinced to take a course of action that runs counter to their own goals. The friction point is that divergent moment where the players with a goal, they have a goal with a meaningful fail state. 
As an example, deception checks aren't needed for every single white lie that gets told, unless the NPC has a reason not to believe it. You don't need to dice roll. But when there's an interesting narrative consequence to the player's deception being uncovered, one which won't stall the story, yeah, go for it, roll that dice, baby. Number two is to use passive skills. A passive skill is where you take a character's bonus to a skill, like their deception, and then add 10. So their plus four to deception, add 10, their passive deception is 14, wackadoo. You can use these passive skills to shape the conversation subtly and keep it moving instead of relying on dice rolls. A high passive insight score can pick up things a player doesn't necessarily think to ask to make a check about, and a high passive intimidation score could cast a menacing premise Premise? A menacing presence over the interaction. As a dungeon master, it can be helpful to write these passive numbers down. Keep them on your side of the screen for reference later. Number three is that insight checks are not a lie detector test. Insight checks, they're mainly used to get a general sense of the disposition of the NPC based on their body language, their speech patterns or their mannerisms, not just as a way to figure out whether someone's being truthful or not. It's kind of like a perception check, but for people, it's a people check. Treating insight checks as only a lie detector test is kind of wasteful. It takes the nuance out of your NPC's personalities, their motives. It reduces them to either being an honest Abe or a lying dirtbag Jerry, the rat-faced necromancer. Use insight to indicate... <laughs> You're the necromancer that lies! <laughs> you should use insight to indicate an NPC's level of confidence, or maybe use it to reveal an alternative method to approach them in the social interaction where relevant. Like maybe they're susceptible to flattery or bribery or intimidation. Insight is a key that you can give your players to unlock more ways to interact with NPCs. Give your NPCs more depth and make your social interactions more fulfilling as a result, I reckon. And lastly, we're at the miscellaneous. Here are a few niche but common situations I bet you've run into at least once and a few ways that you could deal with them in the future. Example one is the barbarian shouts, I attack them during a tense social interaction with the toll bandits and ends any chance of a diplomatic resolution. So how do you handle this as a dungeon master? Do you just get to roll initiative? But what if the barbarian rolls poorly? Do they still get to go first in combat because they started the combat? Does the attacking player's quick declaration mean that they get to inflict the bandits with the surprise condition? Well, the short answer to all those questions is no, 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 no. Uh, but whenever you enter combat, you have to roll initiative. Remember that. But more importantly, characters' moods don't go from calm to murderous in an instant. There are emotional and physical cues to indicate characters' intentions. Ask your players to telegraph their character's behavior during a social interaction, even if they aren't speaking. For example, maybe the hot-hearted, hot-hearted? The hot-headed barbarian might start clenching their jaw and scowling and later on they crack their knuckles, instinctively step forward, and even later on they loosen the hoop around their hand axe and get ready to attack. These can be accomplished by, they can be accompanied by a deception check for the barbarian if they want to hide their intentions to catch the bandits off guard, as well as passive insight checks from the bandits and the party to notice the angry brute getting impatient. This serves to gradually shift the bandits' behavior and create a more nuanced social interaction. The bandits might step aside to let the party pass if they pick up on the barbarian's hostile behavior, or they might panic and attack out of desperation. But mainly, this curbs the power of a single player to immediately decide for the entire party that this conversation is over and we're getting into combat. I mean, what if the other players were enjoying the conversation? Like, did that seem fair just to end it to crack some skulls? The barbarians might say, yeah, that sounds fair, but I don't know, I don't know. My example number two of these nuanced situations is social interactions during combat. This includes things like convincing enemies to surrender or flee or challenge a specific enemy to fight you specifically. Now I've got two solutions here and this seems simple, right? Simple and stupid, but you can either allow these skill checks or you can not allow them. Those are my solutions. Because even though it's great to have players role-playing during combat, it is a huge shift in the battle to remove one combatant using only a single charisma skill check. If you do want to allow this kind of thing, a character would need to use their action to make a skill check to convince that enemy to flee or surrender, or get a leader to order their forces to stand down. Now, I don't feel particularly good about using dialogue to end a combat, and I wouldn't allow it in my game. But players would still attempt it, I know they would, and so I think there should be some kind of mechanical provision for conversation in combat. 
I think the most elegant solution is something hard-coded into the rules, but something that doesn't confer such a massive strategic advantage like removing a combatant. Critical Role did this rad thing recently, where they used bonus actions to appeal to one of their big bosses in one of their big boss fights, right? And every time they succeeded on this um, charisma check, it sapped away one of the boss's legendary actions. So it did have a mechanical worth to try and talk to this enemy that they were familiar with. Now, I've used that idea as inspiration for this latest rule set that I've made on Patreon, which I am going to call Conversation Combat. It's about using bonus actions to appeal to enemies that you're familiar with to sap away some of their resources, like um, bonus actions, like legendary actions, like spell slots, like all kinds of stuff. So that's up on Patreon right now. I really appreciate the support. Probably the toughest thing about social interactions is that whenever I'm role-playing one-to-one on an eye level like that, I am flying by the seat of my pants. I'm just making stuff up. So even when I prepare something like this, if I think about all this and I go, well, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this, I usually just panic and just do something. So who knows how helpful this advice is gonna be. Now, wasn't that a little bit of fun? Clearly, this video looks a little bit different to my other videos recently, right? And that's because I filmed it a while ago. My patrons downstairs, they got access to this video months ago. So if you wanna get early access to videos like these legendary patrons down here, then hey, consider subscribing to the Patreon. It keeps the lights on. I'll do the joke or I turn it off. Ha 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 ha, everybody laughs, ha ha ha. All right, become a patron. I'll see you later. Thanks for watching, I love you, goodbye. <laughs>